is Your Life, a program for all America. And now here he is, Mr. This is Your Life himself, Ralph Edwards. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us on This is Your Life. Tonight, let's turn the lights on over there by the double door and watch carefully to see what happens. Our honored guest, whom we're about to surprise tonight, is known to all of you as one of the truly great and beloved stars of the theater, motion pictures, radio, and television. Pan the camera quickly, please. He's not coming through those doors because he's seated right there innocently watching our producer's monitor. Tonight, this is your life, Boris Karloff. I do mean it. All right, pal. Come here. <laughs> Boris, I think we really put the... Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, believe me, is the cur I think of all time. He's, uh, he has been giving shocks all his life tonight. Boris, uh, it wasn't as easy as it might seem for it us. It won't be, I <laughs> Ralph's show first and then go on... Uh, from there. We've done it many times before, I think about three or four times in the last couple of months, right, Boris? And how many years have I been trusting you? <laughs> <laughs> the most obvious ruse is often the best. Seriously, Boris, we've been looking forward to this night for a long, long time. I'm sure our audience is in for as many surprises as you are. I hope not. <laughs> when they learn that the Frankenstein monster, the bogeyman of the screen, is actually one of the kindest, most warm-hearted men among us into whose arms Little children run almost instinctively. Well, this is the story we're going to tell tonight. So come along, Boris Karloff, to our stage and to our chair of honor. Uh, Evie, we'll see you later. Axe, will you take... Uh, <laughs> he's falling out, Evie. Take Axe. <laughs> oh, my, we're doing about a, a world of explanation here in about 30 seconds. You've played hundreds of parts on the stage and pictures on radio and television, but your role here tonight is completely new, isn't it? It is indeed. I'm sure you'll enjoy it, so sit back and relax. What did you say? <laughs> this is your life, Boris Karloff. Boris Karloff, that's a Slavic name, but you're uh, not Russian, are you? Uh, no, not Boris? really. Uh, you were born in... I was born in Dulwich, England. When did you take the name uh, of Boris Karloff? Well, when I first went on the stage, 1910, actually, up in Western Canada. Uh, why did you change your name, Boris? Well, it was a family name on my mother's side, and uh, I thought my own name of Pratt, if I ever got uh, known in the theater, might be unfortunate. What was your real <laughs> name before then? Pratt. George, uh, William Henry William Pratt. Henry Pratt. The youngest of nine children, your father dies when you're just a baby, Boris. So you're brought up by your mother and your older brothers and your sister. As a boy, you attend school at Uppingham. I'm afraid the young Bill Pratt was not a very distinguished scholar at Uppingham. Now, I'll bet you haven't the slightest <laughs> notion who that is, Boris. You so many people could have said that. <laughs> <laughs> this gentleman in 1907... Go. We've brought him here tonight from Edgbaston, Birmingham, England. Your schoolmate of 50 years ago at Uppingham, here Jeff is Taylor. Jeffrey Taylor. <laughs> Jeff Taylor. Jeffrey, he remembers, and that's fantastic. <laughs> oh, I've got to say a word. Now, look here, Bill. I've yes. got to a little memento. The old oh, school the tie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, you say Boris, or Bill, as you call him, uh, wasn't much of a student, I can't believe that, Mr. Taylor. Well, not as you'd notice it. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why, even then, Bill, your first love was cricket, wasn't it? Yes. And you yes. played for the House Eleven? Yeah, well, after a fashion. Yes, and, ru and for Rugger as well. Yes, fashion <laughs> too. Now, do you remember... You were on the running eight. I was. You I were. was. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, now, do you remember how we used to walk down the hill to early morning school? Indeed, I do. And how we all ran the last bit? <laughs> Always late, <laughs> yes. and the door being closed yes, yes. in our faces. <laughs> 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 oh, yes. uh, do you remember the Leicester Mile? Yes, yes, yes. indeed. Yes, and, and that... Uh, that uh, uh, and the cross-country runs that used to wind up there. Yes, always. Yes. And you remember that shop in the High Street by mm -hmm. Weldon's? 
where we used to get the... Uh, uh, Baldwin. Was it Baldwin? No, no, Baldwin was the... Um, that was the sports shop. The sport shop. Yes. <laughs> I may have to step in here any moment. <laughs> where, where we used to get those, um, you know... Fruit salad. Salad. Fruit salad. Yes, yes. With, the, with the cream and the yes. bananas yes. and everything. Yes. Yes. Uh, boys, yes. I can see you two fellas could go on for hours reliving your school days. I promise you, you can carry on at the party in uh, your honor, Boris, right after the show at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel where Mr. Taylor, all your friends have been staying. Thank you, Mr. Jeffrey Taylor of Birmingham, England, for being with us tonight. Nineteen oh seven, at your family's insistence, you enroll at King's College in London to prepare for the consular service, but you already had an eye on the theater as a career, so in nineteen oh nine, your mother having passed away, you leave King's College, Boris, and take ship for the greener pastures of Canada. As an actor, Boris? No, I uh, I worked as a farmhand to start with. Yes, you work your way westward across Canada to Vancouver, British Columbia. Mm -hmm. While waiting for that first acting job, uh, how did you make a living? Well, I cleared land, uh, shoveled coal, laid streetcar tracks, did all sorts of things. Then you hear that the Gene <coughs> Russell players in Kamloops are in need of an experienced actor. You apply and are accepted. But uh, you hadn't any professional experience, had you? None whatsoever. Your only experience was, I think, at ten. What did you do in a play there? Well, uh, that time I was, I used to live in Enfield, mm -hmm. and every year at Christmas time, they did a sort of a pantomime for two nights, and uh, I played the Demon King in Cinderella. <laughs> and what, what was the play you made your professional debut in, Boris? Uh, by golly, that was prophetic, too. That was The Devil by <laughs> Franz Bolder. <laughs> well, you're, you're learning your craft as you play with one stock company after another, rattling across the United States and uh, Canada, moving from boarding house to boarding house, and often appearing in two days. In 1915, you're with the Harry St. Clair Stock Company in Minot, North Dakota. Boris, again appearing in Cinderella. But this time, instead of the demon, you were one of the ugly sisters. <laughs> Another voice that you won't recognize, or a voice, because you did re recognize uh, Mr. Taylor, uh, though you knew it well 42 years ago when he was chief errand boy and general helper at the Opera House here from Minot, North Dakota, where he's president of his own advertising company, Mr. J. Warren Bacon. Warren Bacon. Oh, yes. oh, yes. Now you have a... Boris, I, too, have a small mem memento of your years in Minot. It's a picture of the old rooming house where you used to oh, live. Oh, yes, 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 yes. It's one of those gables, yes. I wonder, yes, did I you? Oh, <laughs> the next part Boris played was Charlie's aunt, wasn't it, Warren? Yes, <laughs> convincingly. <laughs> How did the people of Minot uh, like uh, Boris Karloff? Warren? Well, in, in spite of the fact that he played mostly villain roles, uh, they loved Boris, and uh, to give you an idea... George Magnuson used to keep the drugstore fountain open at night so you could go there and have a Coke that, after that the was right across the street. Right across the, the street. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Bacon of Minot, North Dakota. Thank you. It's 1919 now, Boris, and it finds you in San Francisco. Lawrence Stock Company, of which you're a member, is playing the majestic uh, theater there, south of the slot. It was at the old Majestic, Boris, 38 years ago that I shared a dressing room with you. Well, now you haven't seen this fellow actor in 25 years. He's now sales manager of the Culligan Development Company in San Mateo, California. Here is James Edwards. Jim Edwards. Hiya, Boris. Good to see you. Yeah, I'm glad to see you. I'm the only one who stuck to it, apparently. <laughs> what have you heard? Boris, the Nasser brothers the owners of a chain of theaters in the San Francisco area want you to have these doorknobs. <laughs> They're the same knobs that your <laughs> hand touched every time you went in and out of our dressing room. Well, thank you very much. What do you uh, remember about Boris at the Majestic Theater back in 1919 and 20, Jim? Well, Boris was a very capable character actor, Ralph, mm -hmm. and he was tremendously popular with children. And it was a common sight to see Boris striding down Mission Street, smiling happily, and always followed by an admiring group of six or eight. He was a hard-working actor, wasn't he? Yes, indeed he was, Ralph. I can still see Boris sitting in the dressing room hour after hour, working with greasy, crepe hair and wigs, 
trying to perfect the art of changing his appearance. Anything to cover myself up, in other words. <laughs> and, Boris, believe me, what you taught yourself in that dressing room certainly paid. Thank you very much. Steve. Thank you for being with us. James Edwards of San Mateo, California. Are you going to do make bookends out of these? Or put I them could on your own them, door? Yes, I used to. <laughs> As you used to. Well, wait, we haven't come to that part. You can't tell what we'll have for that there, Boris. How the tools of the up and your insistence on perfection raised you to sudden and unexpected stardom in Hollywood, we'll learn in just a moment. This is your life, Boris Carlo. Well, Boris, uh, English schoolboy, Canadian farmer, stock actor. How many years did you spend playing stock, Boris? Oh, 10 or 11 years. Mm -hmm. A training ground. Efficiency. Very good training ground. Very few actors today have had. And here in 1920, Hollywood is just around the corner. This is your life, Boris Karloff. How did you make the trip from San Francisco to Los Angeles, Boris? On a lumber schooner. A lumber schooner? It was so heavy a deck load, there was no place to sit. <laughs> you started in pictures as an extra, didn't you? Yes. What was the uh, movie, do you recall? I think it was a Doug Fairbanks picture. His Majesty? Yes. But uh, I, played, I played an extra in a sort of a revolutionary army. I think I was the 13th from the left in the back row. <laughs> <laughs> but jobs for extras and bit players are not too frequent. So what kind of work did you do in between? Well, I, I got myself a job in the, in the building material yard uh, with George L. Eastman. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I drove a truck there. Is it? Jeff would say a lorry. Ah, yes. <laughs> you can't get over that Jeffrey Taylor is here. Is it from Edgbaston? One hot summer day in 1930, walking along Hollywood Boulevard, you drop in the offices of the Actors' Equity Association, more to get out of the heat and rest your tired feet than anything else. And casually, you ask if there's anything uh, going on in the way of casting. And what did the man say? He said, uh, are you working? And I said, at the moment, he sent me downtown for uh, to try out for part in a play downtown. You recall the play? A play called The Criminal Code. I shall always remember it. And you get the part at the Velasco, but what's more important, this leads to your playing the same role in the motion picture in of the, the film, Criminal yes. Code. Yeah. This is followed by a good part in Young Donovan's Kid with Richard Dix and Jackie Cooper. And then... <laughs> Darius Carlo. The part that made you immortal to moviegoers. It took us about four hours in the morning. <laughs> Put the Frankenstein face and the head on, Boris. And newly Jack. an hour to take it off. Yes. The whole outfit weighed about 20, 35 pounds. Yeah, you know who that is, Boris. That One of the leading makeup Jack artists Pierce. in motion pictures who flew down here from Angel's Camp, California, where he's working on the Ransom Broidy production, Bullwhip, your very good friend, Jack Pierce. Wonderful to see. The oh, best yeah. makeup man in the world. Ah, what Thank is, you. What is, I owe him a lot. Thank but. you. Boris, I have little of remembrance for the monster <laughs> that you have portrayed. And I think this... Remember the days we worked day and night oh. to create it. Tell them what it is. Right on the day. That's the <laughs> The bolt. electric lot to d connect electricity. I used to call it the alamite. Alamite. <laughs> 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 well, and um, uh, Boris had to work in that heavy outfit all day, every day for, oh, how many weeks? Uh, Eighteen weeks. Eighteen weeks, that right. And but Boris, remember? When you came out to my place at Mancino, and we worked outside in the yeah, yard yeah, to make the yeah, makeup. Yeah. And then from there, we went to Malibu Beach. That's Three o'clock right. in the morning, I think. Three o'clock right. in the morning, yeah, that's, that's right. right. That's and then right. we made the makeup, and we went out to location. And